Today's lecture, we'll be talking about the greenhouse effect and global climate change, also called global warming. Uh, my purpose, the purpose of the lecture today is not to convince you of my opinion or get you to believe what I think. It's also not to convince you of a specific opinion. I'm not trying to convince you that global climate change is something to worry about. I'm not trying to convince you that it's not something to worry about. We're just going to talk about the facts today, the things that we can prove with science. Before we can really discuss global warming, we need to talk about where does this energy that warms the planet come from. And we know that it comes from the sun. The sun, warm, the sun warms us up. Uh, since the sun is a black body, we need to review a couple of terms, namely what is a black body. So I think we've used this term before. Well, I know we've used black bodies before that term, but uh, there's a nickname for black body. Oftentimes we call it a perfect emitters. Uh, black bodies are perfect emitters. And uh, I think we've said that before in class. The definition of a black body, though, is something that never reflects any light. It does not reflect light. Instead, it always absorbs all incident light. Okay, so all, all light that comes off of it, like so all energy that comes off the sun, was emitted by the light. It's a perfect emitter. None of it was bouncing off and came from somewhere else. The area under these graphs is considered the intensity. Intensity is a term you need to know. It is defined as the amount of power emitted per unit area. Okay, here's the equation. This equation is found in your IB data booklet. A good way to think about intensity is if you do something like take a flashlight and shine it on a piece of paper that's really close, that flashlight or that light will be really bright. If you take that piece of paper and you move it farther away, you'll notice that the paper doesn't look as bright. That's because it's the same power or the same energy coming from the light bulb, from the flashlight. It's just being spread out over a larger surface area. So therefore, it is not as intense or not as bright. So if we want to actually calculate the intensity of a light, like for example, we want to calculate the intensity of sunlight on the surface of the earth, we first need to be able to calculate the power, right? Intensity is power per unit area. So before we can calculate intensity, we need to know the power. Um, we've seen that the hotter something is, the more intense it will be. That's because the hotter something is, the more power it will emit. There is an equation to calculate how much power a black body radiates, okay? The equation is this, a radiated power emitted by a black body like the sun is equal to some constant called Stefan Boltzmann's constant, which is right here. This constant can also be found in your data booklet, times the surface area of the black body, so the surface area of the sun, if that, that was what we were calculating, and then the temperature of that black body. So, and make sure you always measure that temperature in units of Kelvin. This equation is also found in your IB data booklet, okay, under topic eight. Keep in mind though that black bodies aren't the only thing that emit ele or electromagnetic radiation. The sun gives off electromagnetic radiation from all spectra. So from all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that includes light, right? The sun gives off light, it gives off radio waves, it gives off ultraviolet, infrared. Uh, microwaves, x-rays, gamma rays, all these different wavelengths of light, it will give them all off, okay? However, other objects also emit electromagnetic radiation. I do, the earth does, everything does, okay? It will emit energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. However, if it's cold or relatively cool, like we are or like the earth is, it will emit radiation in the infrared spectrum which your eyes cannot see. So when we turn off the lights, you, you will, I will be emitting electromagnetic radiation. However, you will not be able to see it because it's not visible light. It is infrared. So because of this, we give off energy as well, but, oh, and so we can actually calculate how much energy we also give off with this same equation. Anything that's a non-black body will also give off energy with this equation. However, the energy is going to be slightly cal calculated slightly different because we are not a perfect emitter we emit less so to calculate how much we will emit less what we do is we simply multiply this equation this part right here by a number to decrease the amount that the power is giving off so we're going to multiply it by a number e we'll call it and that number has to be less than one so e is called the emissivity and it ranges between one and zero if it's one that means it's a perfect emitter or in other words that it's a black body that's why with a black body the e just drops off okay this equation will also be found in your yellow packet or sorry your uh, ib data booklet it's kind of silly that they give you both of these equations one with an e one without an e 
This one is meant for black bodies. This one is meant for everything else. However, uh, the MS, you can still use this one. You just make the emissivity one when it's a black body. So it's kind of silly they give you both, but they do. Emissivity has a specific definition. It is defined as the ratio of the power emitted from, uh, by an object to the power emitted from that or the power that would the object would have emitted if it was a black body, right? So it's the ratio of what it could have potentially emitted if it was a true perfect emitter versus how much it actually emits. So they calculate how much they theoretically should have emitted, and then they actually measure how much it does, and the ratio of those two is considered its emissivity. It's basically a percentage of how well it is emitting. So you can see from this graph, right, this might be the black body curve. So this is if it was a certain temperature, this is the shape of the intensity uh, per wavelength, right? However, if it was not a perfect black body and it had an emissivity of 0.8, then everything just decreases. The whole thing just goes down and shrinks and then it's smaller. This is not because it's a cooler temperature. It could still be the same temperature, but it's not emitting the way it should. It's not giving off the same amount that it should. Therefore, the emissivity is a little bit lower and the graph just shrinks. Or if it's only 20%, uh, the emissivity is only 20% or 0.2, then right, it shrinks even more, and it's the same shape. The peak doesn't shift over anything. It's the same exact shape, just smaller. Let's try a quick practice problem. If the sun has a radius of 6.96 times 10 to the 8th meters, which it actually does, and a temperature of 5,778 degrees Kelvin, then how much power does the sun radiate? Okay, in order to keep this, uh, you can pause it and try and solve this, but to solve it, just keep in mind that we're going to use the same equation we actually did before, or we just discovered, right? Except that it, since the sun is pretty much a black body, we're going to plug in 1 for the emissivity, right? And that's just going to pretty much go away. Also keep in mind for the area, you're finding the area of the sun, and the sun is the, in the shape of a sphere. So you have to use the equation for the surface area of a sphere, which hopefully you remember. If you can't remember, it is 4 times pi times the radius squared. Okay, so go ahead and pause it and give it a try and see what you can calculate. Once you've done so, you will find that the surface area turns out to be 6.09 times 10 to the 18th square meters. And then when you take this surface area and you plug it into the equation, you will find that the answer should be 3.85 times 10 to the 26 watts. So that means that it is the sun is giving off 3.8 time, 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules every single second. That's a whole lot of energy. Okay, so what we usually care about is we care about how much it, is this energy hitting the Earth. So this energy, right, is being spread out. We've calculated the power, but we want to know the intensity of the light on the surface of the Earth. So this energy that we've calculated using this equation, right, the E is dropped because it's 1, we found that the power was this amount, and the, all that power, all that energy is going out. And it's not all going straight to the Earth. Not all of it is going to the Earth. It's actually spreading out in all directions. So it's going out everywhere. Only some of that is ending to the Earth. So if we want to know how much is hitting the Earth, we should calculate the intensity, right, so we can know the power per unit area because it's spreading out. So in order to do that, the trick is we need to get the power in the area. The power is easy. We've just did that. So we take this number, plug it in there for the power. The question is, is what do we do to find the area? Do we do the area of the Earth? No, we shouldn't. But that's because if we were doing the area of the Earth and we took all this power, that would be like we're saying all of this energy ends up on the surface area of the Earth. It doesn't. It goes everywhere along this area. So what we're doing is we're taking all this energy and we're spreading it around the area of this circle. This, actually it's not a circle, it's a, gi a giant sphere. Okay, so this sphere here, it's spreading out all along. And the intensity here, where the Earth is, should be the same as the intensity here, and the intensity here, and the intensity here. We're taking all that energy and we're spreading it out along the surface area of that sphere. So the surface area, this area here that we're going to plug in, should be the area of this sphere which means we need the radius from here to here, or in other words, the distance from the sun to the earth, okay? 
the intensity on the surface of the Earth should be greater than the intensity on the surface of, let's say this is Mars. This is because even though the same amount of energy is being sent in all directions, the energy is being spread out along a larger surface area for Mars because it's farther away. This is just like when we shine a light, right? The flashlight onto a piece of paper when it's close versus far away, right? That light will spread out more when it gets to the area where Mars is, okay? So the light will be less intense. So we're going to quickly calculate what is the, oh, sorry, I forgot this. So how do we calculate the area? Don't forget it's 4 pi r squared, and then the radius is just the distance from the sun to whatever planet. Okay, so if we want to quickly, we're going to quickly calculate the intensity of the light on the surface of the Earth and on the surface of Mars. So we can use this information, you can pause it and calculate. Once you do, you will find that the uh, intensity on Earth, right, is going to be as follows. We take the same power, plug it in. We're going to use the radius, meaning the distance from the sun to the Earth, plug it in, do all our math, and we get 1,361 watts per square meter. That means that there is 1,361 joules of energy hitting or hitting the Earth every single second per square meter. So this isn't just the this isn't the total energy hitting the Earth. This is how much energy is hitting the Earth every second for just a square meter worth of area, right? There's actually a lot more energy hitting the Earth because the Earth is very large. This is the intensity or area or power per unit area. Okay, so let's actually calculate then the answer for Mars. We get 579 watts per square meter, and we can see it's obviously smaller. Even though the radius isn't twice as big, the intensity is pretty much half the size, and that's because the in the equation, right, 4 pi r squared, right, the radius has a big effect because this is area we're talking about. All right, so the intensity of the light coming from the sun, by the time it gets to where the distance where our Earth is, may be about 1,300 uh, watts per square meter. However, when that light hits our Earth, that light is going to spread out along the surface of Earth as well, which is going to decrease that intensity. Now, one, not only does the Earth have a large amount of surface, but it will also uh, decrease in certain areas more than others. So, for example, if light is coming in and hits the equator, it's going to be more intense. All that same amount of energy is going to hit one, slow, one area, okay? And, and versus that light coming in and hitting the northern regions, which that same amount of energy will come and spread out over a larger surface area. So it'll change and vary. We're going to just find out the average intensity on the surface of the Earth now. So to figure out the average intensity over the whole Earth, what we're going to do is we're going to take this intensity that's coming towards this Earth, and we're going to have to spread it out over the whole surface of the Earth. Not all of this light will actually hit this surface anyways. Okay, so we're going to say, well, I want you to imagine if you're looking directly at a ball, like at a, at a basketball or something, when you look at it, it actually looks like it's just a circle, right? A flat circle. And so the amount of energy that we're, is coming and hitting the Earth is going to have a target area that's only a circle, right? Only the light that hits this circle will actually Get hit the earth, right? Anything above it will just pass right on by and below it, same thing. So we're going to take the energy that hits this circle area and we're going to have to spread it all around this entire surface of the earth, okay? So the, cir the, uh, the surface area of a circle is, as we know, pi r squared, okay? And we're going to take all that energy and spread it over the surface area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. So that means that we're taking the area of this and spreading over that, and we're diluting the intensity actually by about a fourth. So the actual average intensity throughout the entire day on any location on the Earth is going to be about a fourth of this, about 1,300 watts per square meter. Okay, so this is a, uh, again, an average throughout the day. It's going to be more, obviously, during the day and pretty much zero at night but uh, this is averaging out throughout the day. So that brings our value of intensity on average to 340 watts-ish per square meter. Now the Earth, we must remember, is also not a black body. So remember the definition of black body is something that always absorbs all light and never reflects any. And any light that comes from it is only emitted, right? 
So since the Earth is not a black body, that means some of the light when it comes in and hits the Earth will actually be reflected. So if we're talking about like global warming or something like that, and we want to know how much the Earth is going to warm up due to sunlight energy coming in and hitting the Earth, we've got to consider the fact that light that was reflected won't be warming up the Earth. So we've got to figure out what percentage of light that hits the Earth will reflect off. In order to do that, we need to know a term called albedo. Albedo, which the symbol for albedo is alpha, is the ratio of energy that is reflected versus incident. Okay, So in short, calculation-wise, it would be the total scattered or reflected power, so whatever amount of intensity leaving right here, divided by the incident power. So it would be 340 divided by whatever amount we can tell is being reflected. Okay. And so we could calculate that if we had those quantities. Now there are many things that affect the albedo of the Earth. You need to be able to predict some. Okay? Some of those things could include the following. The season can affect how much your albedo is, mainly because white reflects more than other colors. And in the winter, there's a lot more snow, right? So it can also uh, influence how much it reflects. Or during uh, winter there could be more clouds and clouds are white and so it will also reflect more light with clouds or snow. Temperature can affect it. Uh, like we say cloud cover can affect it. Uh, there's lots of other things that can affect it but these are the three main things. The annual m the uh, annual mean for the Earth's albedo is about uh, 30 percent. So that's a value that we should remember. 0.3 or 30% is the average. Um, and you can find this equation in your IB data booklet, but you should really memorize the albedo for the Earth as about 0.3. Okay, energy, uh, once it hits the Earth and it's absorbed, so the other remaining 70% that hits the Earth is absorbed, where does that energy go? Well, it is absorbed, before it was absorbed, and it was in the form of wave energy, or in other words, electromagnetic radiation. After it's been absorbed, just like when you sit out in the sun and light hits you and then you absorb the light, you warm up, right? So that energy turns into heat. Now that heat will rise the temperature of the Earth. And we can calculate the rise of temperature of the Earth with an equation. We've already seen this equation, right? The equation that relates change in temperature with heat. The equation was Q is equal to MC delta T. This equation is going to be very similar to Q is equal to MC delta T, but ever so slightly different. It's Q is equal to MA. Uh, sorry, Q is equal to AC delta T instead of M. So you drop the M and replace it with A because you're not really going to heat up the entire Earth from the sun. The sun will not will give the Earth energy, but it will not heat it all the way down to the center of its core. Okay, It really only heats the surface. So we're going to use this equation, Q is equal to AC delta T, where A is the surface area of the Earth. Okay? And C is very similar to C in our Q is equal to MC delta T equation, is like specific heat, which is what C was before, but instead we call it surface heat capacity. Okay? And surface heat capacity is where, uh, sorry, specific heat capacity with the Q is, Q is equal to MC delta T was the amount of heat used per unit, or sorry, the amount of heat required to raise one degree of temperature uh, for every unit of mass. Okay, that's what specific heat was. Surface heat is now going to be the amount of heat required to raise one degree of temperature per unit of area or per square meter. That's what uh, surface heat capacity will be. Now they actually give you this equation on your IB data booklet. So it's basically Q is equal to MC delta T, but they put it in a little weird form, right? They put, write it in terms of the surface heat capacity, and you can still use it. Now, if you abs the Earth absorbs energy, it will warm up. However, the Earth is always absorbing energy because the sun is always shining on it. So the Earth will continually absorb energy after energy after energy, which means technically the Earth should get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and never stop getting hotter. It'll forever get hotter, and eventually we'll all become baked chickens. However, it doesn't do this. We know it doesn't do this. The Earth's temperature stays relatively constant. Sure, it fluctuates from season to season, but year to year it stays relatively constant. Okay, that's because heat, or as, as we, the Earth absorbs energy, the Earth has to get rid of some of that energy in order to maintain the same temperature, 
Okay, so as the Earth absorbs energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, right, the, the Sun sends light to the Earth. So here's the Sun, here's the Earth. Sun sends light to the Earth in the form of all the spectrums, right? It's in uh, electromagnetic and infrared, sorry, uh, infrared light, um, microwaves and uh, ga uh, gamma rays and X-rays and, and all those different rays, sends it to the Earth. The Earth absorbs it and then spits it back out. Remember, you do not need to be a black body to emit electromagnetic radiation. However, since the Earth is relatively cool, it's one of these down here, right? It's relatively cool. Then the amount of, or the uh, spectrum that it's emitting is in the infrared, okay? So as it absorbs energy in all the spectrums, it emits the energy specifically in the spectrum of infrared. Now, this is going to be really important for what we're doing. So compared to the amount of energy absorbed, how much energy should it radiate, or radiate back out if you want to stay at a constant temperature? The two should be the same if you do not want your overall temperature to increase. Now, granted, it will absorb more than it spits out during the summer when it does get hotter. And during the winter, it does uh, spit out or radiate out more than it absorbs, and that's why it cools down. But overall, in general, uh, as a general average, it should be the same if you're going to keep the average temperature the same. Here's an example of the total flow of radiant energy on a planet like Mars without atmosphere. So if the Earth had no atmosphere, uh, we would still have this uh, total intensity of 340 watts per square meter coming into the Earth. Because of the albedo, we would reflect off about 30% of that, or 102 watts per square meter. Now that means that we're absorbing the difference between these two, okay? Well, if the Earth starts off, let's say, really cold at negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, because it's so cold, it's not going to emit very much radiation, right? It's going to be at a low spectrum, and its intensity of radiation coming off should be low. So let's say the amount coming off is only 150. Well, we've got a total incident radiation coming in, or a total incident intensity of 340 coming in, and totally going out, we have 102 being reflected because of albedo, and we have 150 being reflected back out in the form of infrared. So because it's uh, such a small temperature, right, it's only infrared that it's shooting out. So the total going out is about, what, 252, and the total coming in is 340. As a result, the Earth will warm up. Okay, so let's say the Earth warms up a little bit. So now it's negative 12 or negative 12 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, what does this mean? Well, this means that since the it's hotter, right, it's going to be at a different curve. And now I, I recognize that this graph is meant for really, really hot temperatures and um, like suns and stars and stuff. But we're just using it as an example, right? The curve is now taller and the intensity will be greater. So if the intensity bumps up, 195, right now the total intensity coming out will be 195 plus 102, so about 297. And the total coming in is still 340. Again, the Earth's going to heat up. Now the Earth's going to continue heating up until finally the total amount leaving is going to equal the total amount coming in. So now we have total amount coming in about 340, total amount leaving about 340. So therefore, at this point, the Earth will, would stay at this temperature, and according to how much uh, light or, or energy it receives will be how much energy it spits out, and it'll, there will be a certain temperature that will correspond with that particular amount of energy being radiated out in the form of infrared. So this is actually a pretty good representation. The Earth, without an atmosphere, would be on average around negative 1 degrees Fahrenheit. That's on average. Very inhospitable. So here's an example of how we might calculate those quantities we were just talking about. So let's say the total incoming intensity of light from the sun is I. Now the amount that will be reflected out is determined by the albedo, alpha. And so we would calculate that by just taking the original intensity I and multiplying it by alpha. So alpha I is the amount reflected outward. So therefore the amount that's absorbed will be the difference between those two, I minus alpha I. Now, if this, temp this Earth is going to stay at a constant temperature, that means that it's going to have to radiate back outward the exact same amount of energy that it is absorbing. Um, so the amount radiated outward will also be the same quantity, the original intensity minus uh, the amount reflected. All right, so now let's take a look at an example where the we actually have an atmosphere like we do here on Earth. So 
if we still have the same amount of intensity coming in, 340, and uh, so much being reflected out because of our albedo, same albedo, um, and we were at that low, that low uh, temperature before without the atmosphere of negative one degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the, we would still be emitting the same amount of radiation of 238 okay, watts per square meter. Uh, but the only difference with atmosphere is that when it passes through the atmosphere, this infrared radiation, it passes through all those greenhouse gases. And remember, greenhouse gases absorb and randomly re-emit the, um, the radiation. So that means that some of it will be emitted out, some of it will be emitted down, and it'll just kind of bounce around for a little while. A certain percentage will go down. I'm making it up. Let's just say 50% gets redirected downward. And let's say that means the rest of the 50% is being radiated outward. Okay, so that means that we have here um, only instead of a total of 340 leaving, we only have 120, or sorry, 102 being reflected out and only 119 actually leaving, okay? So that means that our total amount leaving is, what is that, 120... Uh, one, right? So 120, or sorry, 221, I can add, 221 watts per square meter while we only have, while we have a total of 340 coming in. So the atmosphere is holding more of that energy in, and as a result, the earth will then heat up a little bit more and raise temperatures more. All right, so just like we were talking about before, now that it's hotter, right, maybe 20 degrees Fahrenheit, now we're at a hotter, uh, curve, right, and so the amount of intensity being radiated outward is greater. If we say, again, I'm making up these numbers, again, uh, still 50% is a let through and 50% comes back, that means that we're still a little bit under, right? 150 plus 102, that's 252, so that's not quite enough. So we're getting warmer and warmer, right? And so overall, the overall effect is the Earth is going to be able to be hotter with this atmosphere because it's like a blanket. Okay, and then the last one, um, the average temperature of the Earth averages out to be around 53-ish uh, degrees Fahrenheit, which allows for, finally, um, your uh, total amount leaving the atmosphere, uh, including being reflected from the albedo, being the same amount, 340, as the amount coming in. This is another graph that kind of shows, I'm just going to skip So this is one more diagram that shows a more complicated version of the exact same thing we just showed. Uh, but the whole idea uh, is that this is called um, the greenhouse effect, where sunlight is able to pass through the atmosphere because it is not infrared, and the atmosphere only really redirects infrared light. So being regular light, you can pass straight through, and then uh, will be absorbed in the absorbed uh, sorry, the emitted radiation from the Earth, since it's in the infrared spectrum, some of it is reflected back. And so you have this war extra warming effect due to the atmosphere, which acts like a giant blanket. Here is the greenhouse effect summarized into its bare bone facts. Uh, gr the greenhouse effect is the warming of the Earth caused by the radiation of all spectrums that enter the atmosphere, right? So the Earth sunlight gives off all wavelengths, and they're able to pass right on through the Earth's atmosphere, okay? Infrared radiation is emitted back out of from the surface of the Earth. When it, the Earth absorbs that light, right, it'll emit it back out in infrared because it's cooler than the sun, okay? Infrared is radiation is then absorbed by the gases in the atmosphere and then re-radiated back, back towards the Earth. And so it makes it so the total amount of the energy that leaves the Earth's atmosphere is less than it was without the atmosphere, thus causing this warming effect of the Earth. So there are different compounds that act as greenhouse gases and, and absorb this infrared radiation and radiate it back. Uh, one of them is water vapor. Carbon dioxide is one, and the, one of the ones that we are most familiar with. Methane gas is also one. Nitrous oxide and ozone are also uh, some as well. So the reason why these gases absorb certain wavelengths, specifically infrared type wavelengths, but not others, is because molecules can act like 
masses on springs. If you'll remember right from our simple harmonic motion unit, when we took a mass on a spring and we let it wiggle, that mass liked to wiggle at a very specific frequency. In other words, it had a very specific natural frequency that it would vibrate at. Well, molecules kind of behave like masses on springs. For example, if you had O2, which are two oxygen atoms, it, those two oxygen atoms are bonded together. So it's like this, ox here's an oxygen atom, here's an oxygen atom, and they are attached to a spring, and they're just going to wiggle back and forth. The more energy they have, the more they wiggle. And they also have certain natural frequencies that they will respond to. According to which frequencies they like or that they will respond to determines which wavelengths or which frequencies of electromagnetic radiation they'll actually absorb. If the two match, it'll be able to absorb it. If not, it won't. Kind of like, you know, when you push the kid on a swing at the right frequency, the kid swung higher and higher. If you push it at the wrong frequency, the kid wouldn't. This is a factor known as resonance. Okay, so similarly, the molecules will resonate with certain frequencies but not with others. Okay, the graphs here actually demonstrate this idea that certain, um, certain gases or uh, compounds will absorb certain f f wavelengths or frequencies of this electromagnetic radiation, but not others. Um, this graph you should be familiar with. You don't need to memorize it, but the concept of how, what this graph is saying is, should be familiar. This is actually lots of graphs. Here's one graph, here's another graph, here's another graph. Okay, so th the graphs are the x-axis, are the wavelengths, okay, which can be related to the frequency. So the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, most of these shown here are all in the infrared. Okay, and then uh, this y-axis is the absorptivity, or in other words, when it's high at 1, it's absorbing 100%. If it's low at 0, it's not absorbing any of it. So for example, if we come up here, methane, uh, at this wavelength over here, it's not really absorbing anything, neither this wavelength here or this wavelength or this wavelength or any of these wavelengths up until this point where all of a sudden at this particular wavelength, whatever that is, all of a sudden spikes way up and that's because it'll absorb that particular wavelength. That is one of its natural frequencies and it'll respond, okay? It also kind of absorbs these, not really, but then it really absorbs this one as well, okay? So then we see on the nitrous oxide, very similar pattern, right? Little tiny spikes here and then a big spike here and then nothing and then a big spike, right? And so, you know, it'll absorb some frequencies, some frequencies, but not others. Um, oxygen, right, is, has a big swath over here. So there's actually quite a few that oxygen and ozone will absorb. And then a couple of little spikes. Uh, carbon dioxide, you'll notice these are pre some pretty wide peaks. And there's another little swath over here. So there are quite a bit of uh, different wavelengths carbon dioxide will absorb. The biggest factor is probably uh, uh, water vapor, right? Look at the, the width of all these different wavelengths it can absorb. It can absorb a lot of different wavelengths. And when they absorb it, right, they spit it back out and radiate it back down towards the Earth. So this last one would be all of them added together. And you can see you've covered quite a few of the infrared spectrum. Now a very similar graph, but that is backwards, and I've also seen this kind of graph just appear on the test, um, it, where they, and you just need to be familiar with both of them, right? Where So instead of tell it, showing you the wavelength and absorptivity, it's showing you wavelength and transmittance. So it's exactly backwards. So instead of each spike representing how much, or that it will actually absorb that energy, each spike is showing what it will allow to transmit through without absorbing, right? So these are just the ones that it will allow through and not the ones that it absorbs. Absorbing would be the ones that have zero transmittance. So this particular wavelength, right, water vapor absorbs quite well. Okay, let's find a particular spike, right? CO2 and a nitrous oxide, right? There's a spike right here uh, that shows that that is, uh, it will absorb it because of these two gases, right? So this is a transmittance one instead of absorptivity. You could see a graph with either one. Okay, so we have learned how to calculate the power coming off or the energy coming off of the sun. We've learned how to calculate the intensity of sunlight on the surface of the earth by the time it gets out that far. And we have learned to, or we've learned the equation as shown here that will allow us to take that energy and turn and figure out how much heat or how much the surface of the Earth will increase its temperature. However, this does not have intensity in it. So how do we get to intensity to actually changing temperature? And it's easy to do, uh, but we just got to do a little bit of math. And they actually, since you're going to do the same math every time, they've actually derived a new equation for temperature change in terms of intensity. So I'm going to just quickly derive that right real fast. 
Okay, so the following, you just we're just going to rearrange this original equation so that we're solving for change in temperature, and we get this. We're going to rearrange this equation just do, by doing algebra. Right, Q over AC is the same as Q over A times 1 over C. Okay, so it's just algebraically, this is the same thing. And now we will make note that intensity is power per unit area. Remember, power is change in energy or work per unit time. So this is intensity is also equal to energy divided by time times area. Okay, so over here, that's similar to heat over area, except this is because heat is energy, right? So this is energy over area and time is on the bottom. This is just energy over area. So we got to get time in the equation so we can get intensity in here as well. So what we're going to do is we are going to divide by time, the whole equation by time, so that time is now down here. And we're also going to multiply by time, so time is on top. So that way we don't have to worry about, or so that way we haven't actually changed the equation at all. When you multiply by a number and divide by a number, it's a, not going to change anything overall. Now we can take all this stuff right here and we can change, replace intensity in there. However, since this right here, since heat is actually the change in energy, right, not just energy, uh, this will actually be the change in intensity. So we plug that in here and we get change in intensity is equal to change in time divided by Cs. Uh, and that equals our change in temperature. Or we can rearrange and we finally get the equation. Change in temperature is equal to your change in intensity written out this way. So it's, in other words, your in, uh, your intensity in, meaning the stuff you absorb, minus intensity out, meaning the stuff you emit out, right? So that's how much your change in intensity would be because you're absorbing some and then you're spitting it back out, right? So uh, change in temperature is equal to intensity in minus intensity out, all times the amount of time, how long it's been absorbing for, divided by Cs, which is, again, the surface heat capacity. This equation is also found in your IB data booklet. You just need to know what the variables are, what they represent, and what to do with them and how to calculate it. So just a quick check-in. What happens when the amount of energy that leaves the Earth is slightly less than the amount that is incident on the Earth? The answer, it'll warm up, right? So you're absorbing more than you're spitting back out, and it'll warm up. So when intensity in is greater than intensity out, the Earth is going to get warmer. When can this happen? Because remember, we want the Earth to stay at a relatively constant temperature. Well, this does happen. This happens on a seasonal basis. Every time it hits summer, the intensity in is greater than the intensity out, and the Earth warms up. Then it hits winter, and the intensity out is greater than the intensity in. So it's, it's emitting more than it's receiving. And so then the, the Earth cools off. Right? So this actually does happen very often every year. Okay. On average, though, we want the two to be the same, so the temperature of the Earth stays relatively constant. Uh, however, it's not necessarily going to be the same. We will still gain heat or lose heat, or we have been as a large trend, and that's what we're talking about, and that's what we're calling global climate change.